Om Agyan Timirandasya Ganajana Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yena Everyone together Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bande Ham Shigaro Shri Uta Padakamalam Shigarun Vaishnavam Scha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Pradijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Scha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Svari Vrishabhanu Suti Devi Pranavami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Tarubhishya Kripa Sindhu Prayabhacha Patitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Shri Ala Prabhu Pad Ki Jai Hare Krishna Mahamantra Ki Jai So this yesterday evening or last yeah the night before we began speaking about the Leela of Sri Damodar. So we got halfway through. So those of you who were here, uh, you remember we stopped at the part where Mother Yasoda has captured Krishna and has tied him up. We, do, we didn't include one particular and very essential point of the whole story and that is that um, in her attempt to tie Krishna up, um, she was always uh, frustrated and defeated. And finally, we see after some time, as described by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, little Srimati Radharani appeared, and with her little braid, she removed from her hair, handed it to Mother Yasoda, who tied it onto the rope, and then Sri Sri Radha Damodar, like that. So one of the main uh, philosophical points that is being brought out by the Acharyas in this pastime is that um, there was always two inches or two, sometimes they say two fingers, too short. And what was the reason or there is actually an analogy with philosophy, or with, with actually with, with tattva, that comes in relationship to these two fingers that are too short. In other words, Krishna could not be tied up, and it was always two fingers too short. And the word two, or means that there were two reasons why. And uh, or were two considerations, maybe we can say reasons, but two considerations of why those two inches were there. So does anyone know? Well, yeah. First one is? Our endeavor. Uh -huh. Krishna's mercy. Okay, now... Well, we can also translate that endeavor into the, the bhakti of the devotee and how that bhakti is played out in their execution of devotional service. Uh, Mother Yasoda had that. So why wasn't it one finger too short? <laughs> Mother Yasoda, she had the bhakti. There was no question. There was nothing to be awakened within her that was that was required for her to have bhakti. It was already full-blown bhakti. <laughs> yes. Krishna has to agree. He has to agree, yeah. But what is that principle that makes him agree? Or maybe to, he chooses to agree, maybe not makes him agree, but what is that principle 
that chooses that he chooses to agree to. It's just his compassion, but it's uh, he's overwhelmed by love. <laughs> um, and Mother Yasoda had that love, and she made an endeavor to show that love, but at the same time Krishna resisted that, at least up to a certain point. Seeing his mother uh, endeavoring, so in all, it, it also has a very important principle in our own devotional service. We also may have execute our devotional service with great endeavor and great devotion. But Krishna, only when he is, uh, it's up to him. In other words, there's no way to really determine. When he wants to show his mercy, he does. And how does that mercy manifest? We can say there's three things that come by way of the success of one's execution of devotional service. Well, that's the verse from the 11th canto, right? 11.242, right? Or 41. So what is the translation? <laughs> Yeah, the satisfaction could be can be analogous with happiness. Seeing everything in relationship Krishna can be the principle of knowledge. And the last one was detachment from everything material. In other words, they are now the devotee doesn't have any regards to anything of this world. Automatically, not like there are persons who have to, who practice detachment and those who have actually achieved that principle of detachment. So in bhakti, that principle of detachment can automatically manifest through the mercy of Krishna. <laughs> so now, Krishna's tied up. And, you know, he's a little boy. And little boys don't like to be tied up. <laughs> it's just a feature of life. <laughs> but with Krishna, it's even more so because he's completely independent. He does what he wants, when he wants. And he's not under anyone's moral or <laughs> restrictive rules. This is Krishna. <laughs> but at the same time, he's accepted that position. But now, he, although he's accepting it, he doesn't want it. <laughs> so there's a contradiction in his mood right there, apparently. So now, what does he do? His mother goes away thinking, now I can do my chores. Now, the reason why she tied him up is because her chores are also for Krishna. It's not that she was thinking, well, you know, he's interfering with my chores, and therefore I have to restrict him. No, actually, whatever I do, I'm doing, it's for Krishna anyway. So it's, she's thinking in that way, so her love for Krishna comes in the form of wanting to serve Krishna nicely by doing the things that she needs to do for Krishna. So now she, Krishna's tied up, and he starts calling his friends. Hey, Sudam. Hey, Kinkini. Hey, Vasudam. So he's calling all his friends. So his friends, they come, and he says, you know, untie me. So these are Boy Scouts. You know, they know all the knots. <laughs> they have been trained. But somehow, even though they all are all expert at untying knots and making knots, they can't. So that they, as hard as they try, they can't untie these knots that Mother Yasoda has, you know, applied. Why? <laughs> Who knows the answer to that? That's another principle that is being mentioned in the Shastra. Yes, Jagannath Sutta. Yeah, and that's, that's actually the answer. But also, because they're not in that rasa also. So in being in that rasa means having the ability 
or having the uh, privilege of uh, acting. In other words, Krishna was tied up in Vatsaya Ras and he has to be untied in Vatsaya Ras. <laughs> so now he's tied up and then Krishna is thinking, all right, oh, then he remembers something. Now this is interesting. How does Krishna remember something? <laughs> does he forget anything? <laughs> Huh? Yeah, he, he functions apparently like an ordinary per well, not an ordinary, but at least an extraordinary person, but still one who who takes things according to how they come. <laughs> yeah, so then by the Leela Shakti or by the uh, Yoga Maya potency, which is parasya shakti virahaya suyate svabhaviki jnana bala kriya cha. All those per kriya, bala, and shakti are the different energies of the Lord that work according to His desire, although they're being, they may, they're being managed by the energies themselves, although the energies know the desire of Krishna, so they work according to His you know, command. And all He has to do is think and the energies work. <laughs> so now uh, Krishna remembers there are two rascals who are stuck in trees. <laughs> Their name is Nalukuvera and Manigriva. We're singing that every evening. And uh, so and those trees are in the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj. There are June trees and they're big trees, very powerful trees. So Krishna is tied to the grinding mortar, as we mentioned yesterday. The grinding mortar was chosen by Mother Yasoda to be the thing that Krishna gets bound up to. Why? Because the grinding mortar assisted Krishna in stealing the butter. So he's punishable too. <laughs> so now, uh, Krishna ex exor well, what's the word? He exhibits some extraordinary power. And he starts to run with this heavy grinding mortar attached to his body. And he runs right towards the trees, in between the trees, which are not, there's not much space in between. And he goes through, but the grinding mortar catches both sides of the tree, each tree on each side, and crash. Both trees come crashing down, crisscrossing right in front of Krishna. And the sound was tumultuous, so much so that everyone in Vrindavan thought, oh no, here comes another demon. <laughs> they, were, they didn't know what to think. And now, out of these trees came two effulgent personalities, decorated with all, what we say, regalia, and nicely dressed with helmets, earrings, bracelets, and armor. And immediately they offer their obeisances with wonderful prayers to the Lord. Now the cowherd boys, some of the cowherd boys saw this. Nobody else did. And this is going on. So Krishna is there receiving the prayers. And then of course it explains that they, he blessed them. And then they returned to their position in the heavenly planets. They, are, they were... Uh, sons of Kuvera, who is considered to be the treasure of the demigod and has the most wealth in the demigod. We, we mentioned in previous stories how, you know, even Krishna, when he needed some money, he went to Kuvera to borrow some money. And Kuvera lent him the money with interest. And that's the story of the Balaji temple in South India, Vantekeshwar. That's another complete pastime. So having this position in the heavenly planets, we can, we can go back a little bit and uh, come to the scene of how these two personalities wound up in these trees. Uh, they, because of their position, they were a little bit uh, proud and at the same time quite loose in their behavior. They had met two, two heavenly girls on the Mandakini River, which is the river that flows in the heavenly planets, which is the Ganga, actually. Ganga is Mandakini in the heavens. And they decided to uh, get intoxicated, so they did. 
And after getting intoxicated, they became a little loose in their behavior, in fact, licentious. And without clothes, along with the girls, they went bathing into the river. And then after some time, splashing around and having some kind of fun, <laughs> then this personality comes along. Narada Muni Bhajai Vina Radhika Ramana Nahamre. He's flying, he flies above the ground, but sometimes he comes close to the ground. And he's got his uh, instrument, the Vina, and he's chanting the glories of the Lord. And then he appears on the scene. The girls see what happened, and then, oh my God, here's this great saint. So they become embarrassed and immediately run and put on their clothes. But these two uh, demigods, they didn't even have any regard for the saintly appearance of Narada. So they just continued on with their frolicking. And Narada became a little bit disturbed and said, oh, so you want to remain naked? Okay, therefore I curse you that you will become trees. Now, Prabhupada gives an interesting statement about this <laughs> in a lot of his lectures where he says that you can see there's so many trees. <laughs> so we can understand a little bit about the history of the human race. <laughs> so Prabhupada says, yeah, therefore we see that actually when one wants to remain without clothes, then that may also be just like I remember, of course, I never was part of it, nor ever witnessed it. Maybe Maharaj also remembers back in the 70s, there the was streakers. the streakers. Yeah. <laughs> it is? Oh my God, I thought that was outdated. <laughs> the streakers are, these people, they would just take off all their clothes and run as fast as they can through crowds of other people. <laughs> they would just run, that's all. <laughs> So we don't recommend you take up that activity <laughs> because the results are not so good. <laughs> so yeah, and therefore uh, Narada became quite disturbed and cursed them. They came to their senses after realizing what they had did in front of this saint. And so they started to apologize and offer prayers and beg for forgiveness. Narada was somewhat pleased about the repentant attitude, and so he told them, all right, because you are, you, know, you, you realize of your, your offense, and you're sorry for that, a curse cannot be withdrawn, but it can be modified. <laughs> so he modified the curse by giving them a benediction onto the curse that they would be trees in the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj, and after so many years, I believe it was a hundred years or something like that, I can't remember the number, uh, then the Supreme Personality of Godhead would personally free them from that situation. And that's what happened. Now, Prabhupada, in the purports of this particular section of the Bhagavatam, describes different types of pride. How pride can manifest in different ways uh, according to different way, abilities or different achievements or whatever, or just by one situation in the world. So, uh, of course, out of all these types of pride, Prabhupada mentions that there's one pride that is the strongest of all. And so does anybody want to, I don't want to use the word guess, <laughs> but... Yes, Mataji. The pride of wealth yeah, is the strongest of all prides. As it says in the Bhagavatam, when you have, one has a big crown on their head, it becomes very hard to offer obeisances. <laughs> so, yes, those who are, are wealthy. Of course, we see in the Vedic culture people who do have wealth understand, have some piety along with that wealth, and therefore... They are inclined to use their wealth to support you know, religious projects. But generally wealth, because a person with wealth will think, well, I have achieved success in life, I can get anything I want through my money, 
I can also get, I can also control people. So many things that I can do with the facility of wealth, so one becomes, what we say, proud. Pride is a very hard thing to get rid of, and pride is a very hard thing even to notice. It's very, it's very hard to notice your own pride, if you have any. I mean, other people can see it, but you, it's very hard to see it, because pride is so subtle that it comes out in different manifestations of itself. And one can be proud simply by, if someone says, well, thank you very much, you did something really nice, I'm really appreciated. And then you become proud thinking, well, yeah, I'm a well-wisher of everybody. <laughs> I'm everybody's well-wisher, <laughs> like that. So, you know, even these subtle forms of pride, which can also block one's ability to fully surrender to the Lord. So now, and this is, this is interesting because in this particular pastime, the question is raised, why didn't these demigods, after being you know, freed from their situation by Krishna, why didn't they fully surrender to Krishna and become devotees? Why, did they be, why were they so eager to go back to their position in the heavenly planets? Because that's a question I can't answer. And I can't remember what the Acharyas have spoken, but it is mentioned that they actually that they had that opportunity to advance in spiritual life, but they, they opted for going back to their positions in the heavenly planets. You can, this is some philosophical speculation that we may enter into here. When he was a lizard? Yeah, when he was a lizard, but he was even touching Krishna. Krishna picked him up. He had to go back to the heavenly planet because he had no position there in Vrindavan. I guess we can also say, doing, yeah, accepting that as a principle, we can also say maybe their devotion increased also along with that. But that question is raised in that pastime also. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. So yeah, one usually has to stay within their position, but hopefully their bhakti will um, be accelerated after having the darshan of Krishna. <laughs> okay, so now uh, Krishna's tied up and the two Arjuna trees are laying right next to him. The commotion brings the residents of Vrindavan, especially Nanda Maharaj, to the scene. And Nanda Maharaj immediately sees the situation, runs over, and sees that Krishna is tied up to the grinding mortar, and because he is in Vatsayaras, <laughs> he unties the knot. Krishna is so happy to see his father, and his father is even more happy. So Krishna jumps on the lap of his father and says, Father, I want to remain with you. Which indicates I'm not going back to mother, <laughs> as he says that. And, if, and so his father is very happy and shows a lot of affection. But then he, at one point he says, but what about your mother? And then just around that same time, Yasoda appears on the scene. And Krishna sees her and she sees him and she looks at him and she opens her arms to welcome him and Krishna turns away. <laughs> As we mentioned in the yesterdays, the, the maidservants were not there during this pastime, 
Balaram was not there. Rohini was not there. All the persons who could have prevented and would have prevented Mother Yasoda from tying up Krishna were not there. So that was, we might say it was Krishna's arrangement that this pastime played out. But it appears that in the uh, in the moods that it's being understood, in other words, Krishna didn't like the whole idea of being tied up. <laughs> and therefore he wasn't feeling so inclined to go back to his mother. And then, at that point, his mother, seeing that Krishna was rejecting her, immediately she started to cry and left the scene and went into the other room and started to lament. Nanda Maharaj looked at his son and said, I think you should go see your mother. <laughs> so, being very obedient, Krishna was very obedient to his father. It's always been like that. You can see it even as he grew up. He always wanted to please his father, and he always wanted to... Uh, his mother, sometimes he would listen, sometimes he would not listen. <laughs> but with his father, he was very, very respectful and very obedient. And so immediately he went to the room, and seeing his mother, his mother saw him. And then she looked at him, and Krishna ran towards her and jumped into her lap, and she was so happy to receive Krishna, and Krishna was also feeling the love again for his mother. So this is a very, uh, what we say, deep pastime. Uh, there is many comments by the acharyas on the different moods that are being played out in this particular pastime. So the more you hear this pastime, of course we have the book by Shiva Ram Maharaj, which is inter interesting, Damodar Janani. Janani refers to mother, so that book is really about Mother Yasoda's love for Krishna. And it's, it includes a lot of the comments by the Acharyas from different Shastras that are in relationship to this particular pastime. If you get a chance, read it. It's, cool. it's worth, it's an absorbing reading. Like that. So I'll stop there because uh, I think that's about it for this particular pastime. Any comments or questions in relationship to Damodar Leela? Today is also the uh, disappearance day of Srila Naratam Das Thakur. Mm -hmm. It's one of the many celebrated days in this month for the, the Acharyas. This month is full of various types of uh, festivals, holy days, honoring great souls, like that. As we mentioned yesterday, and just for the devotees who weren't here yesterday, this pastime of Krishna stealing butter and being tied up was on the Diwali day. The Bhagavatam indicates that, but there was a reason why it was done on that day. And Krishna was the one to give the reason is that when he distributed the the butter to the monkeys, he wanted to reciprocate <laughs> the monkeys' service to him when he was in his manifestation incarnation as Lord Ramchandra. So that's interesting. <laughs> so Krishna is not ungrateful, <laughs> even to monkeys. <laughs> what to speak about us? <laughs> who have sometimes tendencies like monkeys. <laughs> All right, if there's anything else that anyone wants to add to the pastime or in relationship to the month of Dhammadar. Okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Sri Sri Radha Dhammadar Ki, Jai Kartik Vrata Ki, Gaur Pemanande.